Okay, I've got about 10 minutes to talk to you about um, aspects of e-government or some aspect of the political process of uh, that might be um, affected by the use of technologies. Okay, um, I think one of the key points here that comes through is that you can usefully decide to focus on, on, on one of two areas. You can either look at um, e-government, okay, in terms of how the government simply, like any other large organisation, takes advantage of the, the various technologies available to improve how it runs itself and its various systems. Or you could concentrate on some other aspect of the political process, such as electronic voting, or how parties and candidates promote themselves. Um, it, it wouldn't be reasonable, and we wouldn't expect it therefore, uh, in either an essay or an exam thing for you to try and look at both areas, because you know, the, 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 the too big an area to, to sort of synthesise together very useful. So it's better to concentrate on kind of one or the other. If we're looking at the thing about um, the role of government itself, okay, and how it can use the technologies, then what's really useful there is in many ways, especially if you study things like the issues around um, intranets and extranets, okay, and you look at why they're useful for organisations if you've been to if you went to those lectures or look at how Tesco for example has used certain technologies to improve itself. Well the same kind of advantages that can be had uh, by commercial organisations can be had by government. So if it's committed to delivering efficiencies through e services ranging from everything from direct transactions between the government and its citizens um, to associated services, then it gets the same benefits as any other organisation. So if for example email is adopted by many organisations because it's much cheaper and more flexible and scalable and has all the advantages that we know email ha has, then the same is true if government were to adopt it, be it national government or local government. Um, if intranets and extranets benefit commercial organisations, then the same is true for government. Okay. Um, and so there's a whole area to be looked at there in terms of you know how it's everything. So I think of pseudo government services as well. So I think of things like the NHS and stuff. You know, massive system, massive scope for the use of intranets and um, extranets there to help deliver economic efficiencies in an organisation of that kind of size. Um, interestingly, there are some um, concerns sometimes that are specific to government, or, or certainly um, are often highlighted, even if they're not exclusive to, to government uses of technology. Um, and this results around uh, well, a couple of things that often come to light. One is the fact that um, many major government IT projects have a really bad habit of running way over budget and not delivering. And you can do a quick search and you find many examples of that, okay? So NHS, IT, computer systems, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and there's also often issues around personal data and privacy and protection that comes up. So again, Government systems are slightly different to many commercial systems insofar as the government may hold unique information about you. It may hold information about you that nobody else but the government could ask for and expect to, to learn. Um, but with having that information, okay, comes issues around it, you know, the issues of actually keeping that protected. Um, and there's a couple of areas that often come up. One is this idea that if you connect all the data to, together and connect all these different data centers together, so if I connect the information about you on the NHS um, versus the tax system versus the social benefit system versus the educational system, if I connect all those together, I get a really big picture about all the activities and things and a profile of you as an individual. And there's kind of, you know, big brother Orwellian implications around that. But at a much more kind of um, mundane, for whatever expression, pragmatic level, is this issue again about you know data security and stuff. So things like NHS electronic patient records, um, in some ways it would make a lot more sense to have NHS electronic patient records, um, but protecting those systems, making sure that only the right people can access them, etc., are a big issue. So how do you have sort of electronic records that are both easy to access, so you get wheeled into A&E, they identify who you are, they quickly need a system that means they can pull your records out um, of the system, but at the same time something that verifies that the person pulling them out is doing so for a legitimate reason, okay? So, of course, it's over nicely into the areas around sort of hacking and, and protection and stuff like that. But even without the issue of um, the, the worrying about people hacking into the systems, it's simply that, you know, is this person here, are they actually authorised, should they be looking into your records, why are they looking into your records? 
Is it because they actually need to, or is it people poking around because they're trying to find information about celebrities, politicians, whatever it happens to be? And it's a great example that came up recently where things like these systems can go wrong, where there was the new doctor's enrolment project, um, where doctors could apply for jobs online, and there was a problem with the system, which meant lots of doctors' personal details, including issues like sexuality and stuff, were all there, other people logging into the system could see them, okay? So... There's a, there's a big association of um, as cock ups as well as conspiracy when it comes to long term um, and large scale government projects. Um, in terms of other things, uh, if you're looking at aspects of the political systems, and we think like electronic voting, uh, this is an interesting area. There's lots of very specific articles and examples you can find on it. Um, there's been a, a long running development here in the UK to try and look at e voting as a means of countering the kind of long term decline in voter participation rates. Uh, but what's interesting to come up in the States as well, for example, are issues around where there was particular embarrassments in the 2000 presidential elections where uh, people couldn't work out where there was very close to, you know, who, how people had voted. They were using very old technologies. People were using, you know, um, papers with bits punched out of them and people were having to examine these pieces of paper and to see um, exactly how these bits had been punched out and did it qualify. And, you know, for, for a nation that had put people on the moon many decades ago, this was something of an embarrassment. So they looked at the thinking, well, let's solve it. We'll, we'll go high tech, we'll have electronic voting. But issues that have come up there are the fact that, again, these systems are fallible, that these systems can be tampered with. And worst of all, a system might be tampered with, but you might have no way of knowing it was tampered. Okay? So that would be very difficult if there was an election result and people called into question um, and there's no paper trail that goes back with it. Okay? So whilst paper ballot papers might be old fashioned in some way, they do allow a, a paper trail. So there's a hot debate around that and look up issues around diebold machines. Do a search for diebold and e-voting and you'll find some nicely articulated things about that. And again, look at the lecture notes, you'll find lots of information about it. So I mean, so that's it's a good area to look at. And it may be um, that outside of kind of electronic voting, that there are the issues again, you know, do you use electronic ballot boxes or do you actually allow people to vote? online so via email or over a secure internet connection or do you let them use sms messages or, or whatever um, and if you don't vote at the moment but the fact you can vote from your mobile phone or by the web would it really encourage you to, to go and vote um, all of a sudden um, or are there other issues okay it's not just the fact that it's inconvenient to vote um, that are problematic so these are useful things to suggest um, and it may be that actually that the technology is fantastic but perhaps not so much so at the moment with the voting process itself but in terms of you know if I want to find information about candidates political parties if I go onto the web all the major parties have websites candidates will have websites perhaps I could sign up to email and list to get information if I'm into a particular call so I want to know about what's going on in Darfur or if I want to save the whale or if I want to be carbon neutral or whatever it happens to be I can sign up to lots of sites so it could be that the technology is really good about getting information that allows me to make an informed decision about voting and of course many candidates now put adverts out and things on the web just as they do on television and many candidates are now beginning to make use of kind of blogs and other informal ways of putting information out across themselves uh, but increasingly of course it's been uh, adopted by the, the marketeers and the kind of the spin doctors and campaign people to put up particular messages uh, you know, we shouldn't be naive about that. Uh, so an interesting area, but, you know, think in terms of the government either as a large organisation that can possibly uh, enjoy the generic benefits of, of ICT that many other organisations do, OK? Um, or think of some aspect of the uh, voting process, the political process, whether it's electronic voting or it might be the use of um, parties and candidates in the actual kind of campaign and information giving process part of it. So um, that would keep you plenty, plenty busy, wouldn't it? Okay.